Bible, turn over to Exodus chapter 34. I want to start this morning by asking you some questions. Do you ever feel like you can lose your salvation? Do you ever doubt God can forgive you? Do you ever stagger at unbelief at the promises of God? Do you have trouble with worry in your life? Did you grow up with a father who made promises to you but didn't keep those promises? Has God given you a word but it's not come true yet? You've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Are you claiming one of God's promises yet it doesn't seem like anything is happening? If you can answer yes to any of those questions and you need to understand the attribute of God that we are going to see this morning in our passage in Exodus chapter 34. We have been in this passage for several weeks. We have looked at every other quality of God in this passage. And so today we are rounding it out. As you stand in respect for the Word of God, I will begin reading in verse 5. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him, that is with Moses. And he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands? Who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin? Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worshiped. You may be seated. Today we're going to see God as the one who is abounding in truth. God's truthfulness. God's faithfulness. And we're going to be answering several questions in our look at God's truthfulness. The first question is, what does God mean when He says He is abounding in truth? There are three things I believe God is saying. First, He's saying that He is infinitely dependable. Infinitely dependable. You see, the word carries the idea of certainty, dependableness, faithfulness. Sometimes it's translated faithful. Trustworthiness. Now, when we speak of a person who is very dependable, we'll say something like, you know, he's as solid as a rock. That means you can count on this person. He is stable. He is dependable. He is trustworthy. So it should come as no surprise to us that the Bible speaks of God who abounds in truth as being a rock. Psalm 18.31 says, For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? And again in Psalm 62, My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. God is a rock. He is dependable. He is trustworthy. You can count on Him. If you will anchor yourself to God, then no matter what comes into your life, you will not be shaken. Because you will have the solid foundation. Next, when God says He abounds in truth, He means that He is ultimate reality. Ultimate reality. Now let's talk about this for a moment. Stay with me. This is going to stretch some of you, but stay with me. It will be worth it at the end. What is truth? Truth is what is actual, what is really so, what is reality is what's true. 
If I say right now it's snowing outside here in Mableton, that's a lie. That's not true because that's not reality. You understand? Now, if I say here in the eastern time zone it's 11.27 and 27 seconds, that's true because my watch is an atomic watch. It sets itself each day by a signal sent out from Colorado, I think at the Naval Observatory, and so it's accurate. That's true. All right, you got me now? So truth is whatever is real, whatever is so. So to say God is truth is to say God is real, that He is reality. God is actually so. In fact, God is ultimate reality because God is the reality that created all other reality. He is the most real, most substantive thing that there is in the entire universe. Now, we have a little problem with that because we think of things being real as things we can see, things that are in the physical world. But I want you to know the spiritual world that you cannot see is actually more real and substantial than the physical world you can see. Because God is spirit. And there is no reality greater than God. He is a reality in which all reality is dependent. Both for its existence initially and continually. If God did not keep everything in reality going, it would cease to be. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus upholds all things by the word of His power. Scientists get down to the, to the atom and they see the electrons and they see the, uh, the neutron and they see the protons and they say, you know, we don't know what keeps it together. What keeps it from flying apart? Now you and I know it's Jesus that upholds all things by the word of His power. Everything that you and I know that God continually keeps it going. If He but would let go for one nanosecond, nothing would exist at all. He is ultimate reality. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus says, I am ultimate reality. I am the truth. And so when God says that I'm abounding in truth, He's saying, first of all, that He is infinitely dependable, trustworthy, solid as a rock. And that He is ultimate reality. The third thing that I believe God is saying when He says that He is abounding in truth, He is saying that He always speaks the truth and He cannot lie. Hebrews 6 tells us this, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Now let's think about that for a moment. Why is it impossible for God to lie? I mean, does not the Bible say somewhere else all things are possible with God? And yet now we're saying it's impossible for God to lie. How do those two things fit together? Simply put, it's impossible for God to lie because when God says something, it becomes reality. Now, see, I can say it's snowing outside, but it's not snowing. That's a lie. If God says it's snowing outside, let me tell you, it would be snowing outside. I can say it's 1131 now, and it's so. But if God says it's midnight right now in the eastern time zone, it would become midnight. He would change the laws of nature as we know it, cause the sun to go where it needs to go, and the earth to rotate where it needs to be for it to be midnight right here. So if God says it, it is reality. So He can't lie. Because if He says it, He makes it true. You remember, He created all things by the spoken word. When there was no light, He said, let there be light. And there was light. 
He can't lie. Because when he says it, it's true. It changes reality to what he says it is. So he cannot, it is impossible for him to lie. So when God says he is abounding in truth, he's saying I am ultimate reality. He is infinitely dependable, faithful, trustworthy. And he will always say what really is. It's impossible for him to lie. Second question. Why is it so important that God abounds in truthfulness? So what, preacher? What's the big deal that God abounds in truth? Well, first of all, if God lies, then many of His attributes would cease to be. Think about it. If God lies, He cannot be holy. If God lies, He cannot be righteous. If God lies, He cannot be perfect. If God lies, He cannot be loving. If God lies, we don't know that any of His attributes are true. If God lies, then all that we understand about Him must come from our experiences of Him as we see Him. If God lies, then we can't count on anything that He says about Himself to be true. If He lies, we do not know that He's all-knowing. We would not know that He is loving. Do you think those parents of those 20 children in Newtown, Connecticut, if they were judging God and what He's like by their experience today, would they say God is loving? If all we had to determine what God was like is our own experiences and how we interpret those experiences, everybody would have a different view of what God was like. And that's why those who reject the Bible in our modern day have so many views of what God is like. Because the only thing they can go on is their experience. And when they look at what's going on in their life, then they try to make up and determine what God is like by that. There's no objective standard to each his own. So if God lies about anything, and everything that he said about himself might be a lie. So it's very important that God abounds in truth, or his attributes and the God as we know would cease to be. Secondly, it's important that God abound in truth because truthfulness is the basis of relationships. Relationships are built on truthfulness. How many marriages have been destroyed by lies and deceit? I was talking to a man just this week who admitted to me that his marriage had fallen apart and crumbled because of his lying to his wife. It takes years to rebuild a trust once it has been broken. If I don't trust you, I'm not going to give myself to you. If I can't trust you, how can we have a true Friendship. Relationships are built on mutual trust. Think of how many parent-child relationships have been damaged and weakened by lying. Now, young children are going to lie to you. That's just their nature. But you've got to work on that and get that out of them. But now, by the time they get to be teenagers, they need to be telling the truth. And when you lie to your parents, teenagers, and they find out, guess what it does? It hurts that relationship. Because if they can't trust you, then they can't let you out and do things because they don't know what you're going to do. And let me tell you, it takes a lifetime to build trust, but it only takes one time to destroy it, doesn't it? It is very important that we be trustworthy, that we be truthful, because... Dishonesty, lying, destroys relationships. Now, if this is true on a human level, and of course it is, 
How much more true is it so on the divine level? How in the world could we have a relationship with God if He lied to us? How could we trust Him for our salvation if He lied to us? And we didn't know if what He said was true. How could you surrender to a God who lied to you? You wouldn't even know what He was like. Why would you surrender to Him and give your life to Him? Why would you? I mean, how in the world can we know that our sins are forgiven if God lies to us? We couldn't. And so it is crucial. It's not just a good thing that God's abounding in truth, that God cannot lie. It is essential to our relationship with Him. It is essential to our Christianity. It is crucial to our eternal life that we have a God who will not, cannot lie but is abounding in truth. That brings to the third question. What does God's truthfulness mean to us? All right, He's truthful. It's important that He be truthful, because if He's not, then we don't really know He's God and what He's like. We can't have a relationship with Him, but what else, preacher? What does it mean to me? Well, first, it means that the Bible, God's Word, is absolutely true in everything it says. In 2 Timothy 3, we read, All Scripture is inspired by God. And that word in the Greek is God-breathed. It's a word for God and the word for breathe. Now, that's not an English word for that, and so when the English translate it into English, they put inspired. Probably would have been more accurate, expired. But the morticians took that word away from us, so we can't use it. But it is God breathed, that God breathed out His Word. And in the Scriptures, God's breath is synonymous with God's spoken Word. In Psalm 33, 6, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of His mouth, all their host. Now, Hebrew parallelism, you find that in many of the poems, the Psalms. That means that the first line and the second line mean the same thing. You're just saying it differently. You see, to say the word, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and to say by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts, is to say the same thing in a different way. But what I want you to see is that breath and word are used interchangeably, they are synonymous. Now, I want you to put your hand right up here at your mouth. Come on, everybody do it. And I want you to say, God breathed. Now, you feel that air coming on your hand? You've got to breathe to speak. What enables you to speak is the air going over your vocal cords. And so, when God breathed, God spoke. And so, to say the Bible is God breathed is to say the Bible is God worded or God spoken. And remember, if God says something, it is reality. And that's why we can count on His Word. If God says it, it makes it happen. It makes it so. And so Jesus said about the Scriptures in John 17, sanctify them in the Word. Your Word is truth. Now since Jesus is God, He's truth. And so everything he says is truth. And so when he says that word is truth, it's truth. It becomes reality. Jesus speaks reality just as God the Father speaks reality. When Jesus says to Lazarus in the tomb, Lazarus come forth, Lazarus came forth. If Jesus had not called Lazarus but just said to that tomb, come forth, then every person who had died and been placed in that tomb would have come forth. Because he created reality when he spoke. Because he's God. So it is important to us that the Bible is truth. And it is truth when it speaks on matters of theology, when it speaks on matters of science, and when it speaks on matters of history. 
You see, there are those who would want to say, well, I will grant you the Bible's true when it speaks on theological matters, but not historical or scientific matters. Now, I'd be the first to admit, the Bible is not a science book. It was not written to be a science book. But there have been no scientific discoveries that contradict the Bible when it's properly understood. The Bible uses figurative language. It talks about the sun setting. And someone will say, oh, oh, but we know the sun doesn't set now. Well, when you look at the news tonight, the weather, they're going to say the sun will set tomorrow at such and such a time. Well, that's a phrase we use. We know what it means. And so when the Bible is rightly understood, there's been no scientific fact that has contradicted it. You say, well, what about evolution? Well, evolution is not a fact. It's only a theory, not a fact at all. So there has been no scientific fact that's ever gone against what the Scripture teaches. Historical, same fact. There's been no historical incident that has shown the Bible to be an error. For years, liberal scholars said the Bible was wrong when it spoke about the city of Ur, where Abraham was from. They say there's never been any evidence of a city of Ur. It's just kind of like the city of Oz. It's just make-believe. And we know, therefore, the Bible is just filled with myth and story until this archaeologist discovered this plate that had written on it the city of Ur. Proved that men were wrong, God was true. Now, that's just one of many archaeological findings that only verify the trustworthiness of God's Word. You see, when God speaks, He takes everything that will ever be into account. And so when He speaks, He speaks truth, even when the events haven't taken place for years to come. Because God sees everything at once. And when He speaks, it's reality. Let me give you an example. Over in Exodus chapter 3. This is when God came to Moses in the burning bush. And God tells Moses, He commissions him to, to lead His people out of Egypt. Now I want you to notice what God says to him. Verse 8, So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey. Alright, so what does God tell Moses? Two things. I've come to... Deliver them from Egypt, but not only that, but what else? Take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Two things. Take them out of Egypt, put them into the land. All right, now look when he says to Moses, verse 10. Therefore, come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. And you would expect him to say, and bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey, wouldn't you? He said, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to bring them out of Egypt. I'm going to bring them into the land of milk and honey. All right, Moses, I've chosen you to bring them out of Egypt. And you would expect him to say, and bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey. But God doesn't say that. He stops right there. Bring them out of Egypt. Why? Because God, who is truth, knew that Moses was going to sin. He was going to hit that rock rather than speaking to it. And God was not going to allow him to go into the promised land. Forty years before. God knew everything. His word is truth. He is abounding in truth. So that's the first thing we know and why it's important. Because God's word is truth. Secondly, we know if God says it, it is reality. If God says that my sins are forgiven in 2012 by the death of His Son, 2,000 years ago on a cross, and guess what? It's so. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to be able to explain it. If He says it, it becomes reality. If God says heaven awaits His children in eternity, it is so. If God says He'll never leave us or forsake us, it is so. If God says that if I have Christ, I have His absolute righteousness, then it is so. If God says that an everlasting hell awaits those who reject Him, it is so. Because God's Word is ultimate reality. And because of that, 
It will last forever. Amen. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 24. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Because it is ultimate reality. Thirdly, you can depend on God to keep His promises to you. You make sure that it's a new covenant promise. You can't go pick up one of the old covenant promises in the Old Testament. And particularly, we like to pick the ones about prosperity, that He promises them prosperity in the land if they'll obey. You can't go grab that and say, Okay, God, my barns are going to be filled. I'm claiming this promise. No. God promised the old covenant people if they would be faithful and obey, He'd bring them in the land, He would make them prosperous. But you know what He promises you and me as new covenant Christians? All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Through many tribulations you will enter the kingdom of God. God gives us promises. Make sure it's a new covenant promise. Make sure you're meeting any conditions of that promise. And then you can trust and depend on God to move heaven and earth, if He needs to, to fulfill His promise to you. If it appears God is not being truthful to you, guess what? The problem's on your side, not His. It's on your side, not His. I remember after we had had three daughters, uh, God gave me a word that I was going to have a son. So when Terry became pregnant with our fourth child, we knew it was going to be a son. We didn't even pick out a girl's name. No need to. It's going to be a son. I was in that delivery room as I was with all of them. And when that baby came out, it was a girl. <laughs> I mean, I actually said to the doctor, I said, is there another one up there? Because God had told me it was going to be a boy. Now, I never doubted God's truthfulness. I knew I'd made a mistake. I knew somehow, somewhere, I had messed up. I didn't blame God. I knew He had told the truth. Somehow, I'd either misunderstood what He'd said or something else. But it wasn't Him. The problem was here. Well, you all know my family, so... You know, 18 months later, we had twin boys born. God said, your timing was off. See, you thought your time, it was my time, not your time. My way, not your way. After those boys were born, a guy in my church needed a kidney transplant, and his wife said, get the preacher to pray for you, and you'll get two kidneys. <laughs> But I didn't ever doubt God's truthfulness. See, sometimes, you remember when, when Mary and Martha sent those messengers to Jesus that Lazarus was sick? You remember what Jesus said? He said, this sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God. So those guys went back, and, and they came to Mary and, and Martha and said, we got good news. Jesus said, this, is de this disease is not unto death, but to the glory of God. And then Lazarus died. Now, what do you think they thought? But you and I know the story, don't we? He is the resurrection and the life. He had a greater blessing in store. He came and raised him from the dead that he might be glorified. More glory than raising up a sick man, but raising a man from the dead. God says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now that's given in the context of giving to missions. Paul had a church that was giving to his support. And he said, I want you to know God's going to meet all your needs. He's going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. Now, God says it, so it is reality. It is so. Now, you make sure you're following biblical stewardship. He doesn't say go out here and spend 
$2,000 at Christmas on a credit card and then say, okay, God, meet my needs now. You said you would. Now, first he said he'd meet our needs, not our wants. So you've got to first get that straight. Is this really a need or just a want? That TV, 50-inch plasma, is not a need. Trust me, guys, it's not a need. You think it is, but it's not. It's a want. But God has promised that He would meet our needs as we look to Him, as we trust Him, as we follow solid biblical principles of stewardship. And He will move heaven and earth, if it's needed, to meet that need. The last thing is we need to feed on God's truthfulness. Psalm 37 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate. That word literally in the Hebrew is to feed on His truthfulness. The word faithfulness is the same word we see in our passage translated truth. Feed on God's truthfulness. What does that mean? That means spend time thinking about it. Spend time chewing on it. We talk about that. I'm just going to have to chew on it a little bit. Going to have to mull on it. We think about it. We're going we're gonna to let it like a cow chewing its cud. You know, just and then bring it back up and chew on it some more. Feed on God's faithfulness, His truthfulness. Spend time thinking about God's truthfulness. His word is true. His promises to you are true. When God says, all who will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that's reality. You call on the name of the Lord in faith and repentance, you will be saved. You can count on it. If you reject Christ, you can count on an everlasting hell awaiting you. God has said it. It is reality. Let's pray. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our Minister of Community Connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area... Uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcomed at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.